First of all, I have to say this happened to me and has nothing to do with architecture. When I came here after New York, I got to know people and I wanted to live uh, in our own house. So we had to post, I had to post, I didn't know my wife then. I got to know, we were about to get to know her. I bought this farmhouse across the street and then this was sort of like the spirit of 68 still. So we were doing this with our own hands in the early 70s, 71 or something. This house over there, and since and I didn't plan this to be for any period of time. But then I found my wife, she's from the, here, from the Engadin, Roman speaking, and then the children are born, and they start to speak the local dialect. And then after a while, I accepted the fact that I would be here and, uh, and it felt good and this feels better and better. <laughs> I never, no. at first 10 years I always thought when I came to Zurich from the uh, outside world somewhere, I always had to think I'm going in the wrong direction, this is not going up to the Alps, this is not my direction, I should be going down we say, to Basel. But I remember a beautiful day when I had some Los Angeles student, students coming uh, to find a very small place in the Alpine, Alpine area here nearby. And, uh, and I was driving up in a late summer day alone to meet them. I had given them this exotic place where they would have to come and meet and we would be working for a whole semester on the sound of the landscape. That's why, so I went there and then there were these beautiful black shadows already in the landscape as we, as you know, when the summer passes and autumn arrives. And I was feeling sort of happy and then obviously they, Shit, I like all of this. <laughs> so this, I know this was the moment when I realized I'm here now. My soul is now up here. And uh, yeah, since then, it feels good. But do you need silence to be creative, to think about your projects? Not in part. First of all, I have to say this kind of area you're seeing here this is like a farm, this an architectural farm. Uh, maybe this office is run like a, maybe like an old-fashioned master class, because we work like a family all together. There are people from more than different, uh, ten, more than ten nations, but we work together like a, you know, like a master class all together, uh, and uh, that's what I like about this place. And then it. I don't own anything else, but uh, it felt natural to do this here, but I came to realize it's actually good that I'm away from the big centers of the world. In a very interesting Swiss way, because in an hour and 15 minutes, I'm at the airport of Zurich, which is an international airport. And in an hour and 15 minutes, I don't get very far from the Los Angeles airport, right? In Los Angeles themselves. So this is exclusive Swiss situation. Maybe you know this from your country also. You're on the countryside, but actually in the middle of the world, okay? That's, so this is good that the whole, it's not an urban environment. Uh, not all the colleagues are looking over my shoulder and what is he doing and so on. I don't, I cannot need any comments of colleagues. 
uh, say, oh, I will do this or something. You know, this this is like, if you work like an artist, you need your own separate space because they might be right and you are wrong and so you don't want, you don't want to know. Right? You want to do your own thing, okay. And later when it's finished, it's, it goes out and then it's open to a, a reception of any kind. And then it's quiet, but I think I could also uh, create a quiet space in the middle of a city and certain parts. Um, I work very well in a very noisy, uh, a very noisy environment of a railway station or so. Where we do you know this anonymous kind of a, um, sound of a city? It can be very uh, great, and then you're inside. You're like in a protective ocean of sound, so something could be very beautiful, and lots of noises, so the different kinds of silences, or different kinds of mental silence or peace, when you are at peace, or when you can, uh, when you can concentrate, you have to be able to concentrate, I have to be able to concentrate. I can concentrate here, I can concentrate with my people, it's nice that they're around, I can go and travel to them. And, uh, it's also nice that you have to go out of the building, and so, so it's like a, a, into your next one, and the, uh, out and into your third one, so it's like a campus in a village. <laughs> oh, I like that. I always had. I, I find this nothing special. I go somewhere and I think it's probably rather easy to feel the space and see it and so and have an idea how I should react there as an architect. So I go to South Korea and then I'm in a, in a Catholic theme park. I've never seen anything like that. And the priest wants me to do a chapel and the highest point there and so on. And then it's interesting to observe. I seem to know a lot. And then we, uh, this has to do with the fact that we all know a lot. <laughs> we have read books, we have seen movies, it's a big world. It's, they call it globalization or whatever. But since I'm young, uh, Japanese architecture, Chinese architecture, and so this has been part of education. Chinese, classical Chinese architecture is in the work of Mies van der Rohe. You can look at it, find out, and he looked. So it's a bit, uh, so it's not such a mystery. I'm sure there are places when it becomes more nature, less cultivated nature, more direct hard nature like sea or mountain or desert. I, I think we know about this and I have developed a feeling, I have then a feeling for this. More difficult to understand the people, more difficult to see what are they, what do they mean when they say this. And this I know in Bavaria, this I know in Switzerland, this I know in Austria, this is my area. I know exactly where, the way when they talk and what they mean, and what they don't say and mean, and so all these things. This is diff more difficult in Russia. <laughs> so when I talk to them, uh, these friendly and warm-hearted people, but there's always a, a secret agenda I don't understand. If I be Russian, I don't understand. <laughs> that's more... That's. That's not what you're asking, but that's what I'm saying. This is more difficult to understand, really. Place is not, uh, for me, not so difficult. Literature 
thinking, and music, this is sort of the nourishing ground of uh, my life. I'm, uh, people say you are actually interested in everything. So I'm, ne I'm never bored. I'm, I could meet somebody from a new field. I don't know. I would, I like to ask them, what are you doing? And I'm, uh, uh, what's, what, what are, what's your work? And, what, and, so. and I like to know everything. So I buy these books. I like to know about the economy. I like, uh, there's nothing I'm not interested in. And uh, it's not only art. It changes something. Sometimes the focus for years is on literature, then it comes to older music, uh, like Baroque music or something. So Bach maybe always uh, stays, uh, Mozart, Mozart I once did not like so much. And uh, now Schubert is becoming bigger, and then I got into contemporary music, music some 20 years ago, I got away from bebop jazz, and uh, I was, was a little bit fed up with this eternal repetition of the same cliches. Then I, was, then I said, okay, I heard this from the 50s, from Miles Davis, so is it's there really in jazz? So this was sort of like, as Frank Zappa, Zappa said, that sort of a little bit dead, or at least smell it, it starts to smell funny, and so on. So there are shifting interests. And I, my son, is a musician, so there I see new things, and his partner is also a musician, so I see new things they're doing. I'm interested in this. I could see in contemporary music uh, how they work outside of tunes and harmonies, sort of with structures or with uh, microtonalities, which become more almost like color or like powder or like. Uh, physical structure, he heard physical structures. And I don't even make, I don't make analogies to architecture. It's not, oh, no, this I can use directly. It's more, uh, as I said, it's sort of a fertile ground. It's a nourishing ground. That's me. I like all of this. I like uh, people writing intelligent essays. I try to understand why do are they saying what they say, and so on. I like to, so lately somebody asked me, would you like to have a talk with Peter Sloterdijk, the philosopher, on the theme of hotels? He would like to talk to you on, uh, about hotels. He is interested in hotels. So that's the kind of offer that I yeah, this I, I would like to do, because I'm sure I can learn something by listening to him. This could be an interesting dialogue, uh, or dialogue learning experience, so I'm asking him, he's asking me, and so that's the stuff I like. That's the world present around what I do. So it's a nourishing ground? Um... Yeah, of course, I think if you work in the creative profession, what I obviously do, because I work maybe more as a rendering services in building, I work more like an author or a, as an architect or like an artist, if you want, or an artist, artist of building or something. There, what you do has to do with everything you are. So, the painter uh, paints with everything he has, and this is everything he learned, everything he his unconscious knows everything he... Uh, we, we are part of history, we are part of a biological, big kind of a life going on, dying, new people coming and so on. I'm surrounded by things which have been done by hundreds of people and thousands of people and many of them are, most of them are probably dead and unknown and still it's all there. But uh, it's an idea I like very much and that's where we come from. And uh, Also when we react by our intuition, our intuition is a fantastic kind of thing that we have intuitions, we can make images, 
We, have, we can produce inner images, like in dream we do this, but you can also do this in daydreams. That you, in dreams it's easy to see that you can see real spaces, a real, perfect, real space you have never seen before. So your brain obviously can do things like that. So that's what I'm working with. I'm trying to probably to provoke my brain to, or my heart, or whatever this is, to, <laughs> uh, to create images. And this always happens again. So I'm up in, the, in the meantime, or maybe I've always been, I'm very confident. I go somewhere, there's a new landscape, there's a new task there, and so on. And there's no image. And then I'm very confident that I know that all of a sudden it will be there. And all of a sudden the image comes, and now I just sort of have the approach of uh, I now I know exactly how I have to work in this landscape with these people for this. And knowing this, I know all the traps. <laughs> and there is the art of construction and the art of building and the art of creating space. I mean, this in, there's also the art of literature or the art of poetry. That's how I mean it. There is something, somebody can be done in an artful way. Or artful sounds a bit too small. It's uh, in a professional, is uh, also covering the whole thing. It has to do with the dignity of making and the high quality of making and the uh, devotion of a human being, of a person, to something he makes. And then this becomes, it's made to the highest standards and it's sort of like a noble thing because it's made by a person or made by a person directing 15 machines. This is not about medieval craftsmanship, it's about your personal devotion to something. This is uh, to the making of things, to the thinking about things and all these things. So there are many, many arts, not only the art, there are the, the art of installations, the art of thinking, the art of painting, and drawing and so on. That's how, how I mean this. So is, there is also the art of building. I think the, the German word Baumeister is a beautiful uh, word. If, uh, Mm -hmm. Somebody will call me a Baumeister, then I'll be happy. <laughs> but we all are born, we all kind of start seeing the light of the world. Some of us play football, some of us read books. Why did you, Peter Sundtura, decide for architecture? What was it in architecture that fascinated you so much that you decided this is my way, this is my art? This is not a, a process uh, of decision. I never decided to become an architect. I became an architect by different by my biography. And you, uh, you can say this is all by chance, this is the contingency of life and all these things. But of course we also know things you attract, you feel attracted to certain things and things. Uh, I know you have talents, people have talents. So how should I explain this? The first 10 years of my life were sort of like running away from my father because he wanted me in his shop and be as the oldest son and take over this furniture making, uh, this Schreinerei shop and so on. So I had to sort of leave him. So you can see escaping my father after he, I had made the degree in the profession meant, okay, I could become a furniture designer. Easy. Because then I, I can use what I had before. Then I went to art school to become a furniture designer. But before I even was there, I already thought maybe I should become an industrial designer. Okay. 
So I looked at this and thought of this girl and said, yeah, maybe I should become an industrial designer. So I went to New York. I go to Pratt Institute. There was Raymond Lowy follower there, Mr. Parriott or something, running the master program. So I show him my furniture. And then he said, yeah, you could come to the master program to me, but you know, my students, they have never made anything you already have made there at art school, like real one-to-one -one chairs and all of these things. The, you will not feel good there. You, you seem to know more than my students know. So then I went to interior design. This I felt this extremely it was sort of superficial. I said, yeah, do I? Th I would like to do the building and not uh, some kind of exteriors of a bad building. So then I dared to go. I ventured to go to the architecture department and. I met Sibyl Maholinot, she was there, and then I wrote two papers for her, and then I got interested in architecture. So I thought my father would like to stay two or three years more, I want to make a degree in architecture, I know it now. And he had paid this one year, <laughs> and then my father says, then my father says, no, and I had to come home, no money. Okay, so I had I could not uh, make an architecture degree, so I had to stop this. Came home, I didn't like this too much, and hated my father for this. Brackets, my daughter taught me half a year, and then one evening she says, you know, he didn't do this against you. He didn't give you the money because he didn't want to lose you. That's why uh, she never met him because he died early. So she, but she has a feeling for him. She says he didn't. He t you didn't get the money to study over there because if you have studied two or three years more over there, you would have never come back. <laughs> She's probably right. Anyway, so then uh, coming back, then this was like uh, around here. This was. 68, 69, I had been at Peace Marches 67 with my friend there in New York against the Vietnam War on the Fifth Avenue and then I came here, everything was politicized and in the German speaking area here and in Germany we all, there was the, the ideology of us was art, design, completely art, right, this is bad. So for 10 years uh, sort of ideological, for ideological reasons, no design. <laughs> and so I went to work for the Denkmar Plague, for this agency for monuments and design, and, and that's why I'm here, right? Because I found this by chance, this job, there was a, nobody wanted to do that. To help the art historian to draw houses, make little projects, and so on. Uh, he still lives over there, and uh, he became then the. The, in charge of Basel and so on. Long story, so this, then I made for 10 years, I made this, which uh, I didn't look for it, it just happened, and then I was here, I looked at 4,000 farmhouses, I stopped my inventories of, uh, I sort of submerged myself in this whole uh, Bauernhaus, Forschung, and Siedlungsforschung, and all, all, all these things. Beautiful time. Uh, I saw art history. I learned a little bit about art history, from like uh, from down looking up, right? Because all these historical things up here in the Alps, they were sort of here 50, 200 years later, uh, coming from the big capitals uh, of the Baroque styles and so on. Extremely interesting also to find out what can I understand about the genesis of a farming village, so certain things I could find out, then I could find out that other things, they just happen, we don't know, we will never know why this is like, looks like this here and over there like this. And then a good side effect was when doing these inventories, I learned how to write. Because I remember that my, my teacher in high school told me, Peter, you should become a writer. And I was sort of laughing at him because I was just copying any kind of, using in any kind of phrases. And so he, he thought that this was good. And then 
10, 15 years later, I had to describe things I saw. And I went through hell for two years, but I could just it. Although then I wrote something about planning once, and then my boss looked at this and said, yeah, it's good, but it sounds so technical. And then this is a shock for me for the rest of my life, right? Me reading books, and he then this, this sounds like a technical report. <laughs> or to suffer for not being able to uh, look at this village study and then say seven sentences. This village is made like this and this and these are the characteristics and topography and architecture. And this works like this. This is what I learned there. Again, I learned to write again. So I, I'm not bad in writing. I can write very simply. I learned, like Wittgenstein said this in other contexts, I learned certain things you can say with words and other things you cannot say. Okay, then what you cannot say, don't try to say it. Stuff like that. So that's good. So see, there is a... Then I decided then 68, 10 years was over and all of a sudden design was possible. So I said, okay, then I made a decision. I said, I have seen enough farmhouses and all this stuff. I'm not interested in this anymore. I want to become an architect. So I went to look at a competition entry with a friend who was an architect. He had entered there and I looked at the 24 entries. I looked at this and said, I can do this better. <laughs> and I can do this better. And then I started to, make com to participate in competitions. And soon I won something, and so it started. So this is a long answer to how did you decide to become an architect? I didn't. <laughs> it happened. philosophy in your head? No, not at all. Then I had to, I started to build up, then this was for the first time, that I also theoretically, I started to deal with architecture, and think and get into this. Before that I was sort of like more like a naive kind of designer. And when I look back, when I look back maybe it's not, it's a bit dangerous to say this, but I can see in my background, I can see the part of my father, farmers and craftsmen, very good craftsmen, excellent, but no artistic thing at all, nothing. My father would, lo would have loved to make beautiful furniture. My other mother always said, yeah, Oscar. It is so complicated, I see, but you know, it's a, it's a little bit heavy. <laughs> he suffered because they look terrible, his furniture look terrible. And he knew it, he suffered from it. He had no feeling for this, no feeling. And I can see the Zum Tor, they gave the name, right? <laughs> I don't see anything like this, whereas in my mother's part, there I can see it. One of the uncles. Uh, a landscape painter, quite uh, well known in Switzerland, and so on. And this is something, uh, it's uh, so interesting. Certain things come uh, to my mind from my youth. I think everybody knows these things. So I'm sort of 17 and I see my mother telling to her friend, looking at me when I walk somewhere there. She must have told this to me afterwards, or somebody must have told because she is looking at me and I'm walking on a little street there. And she says to her friend, you know, when he wears this American parka, <laughs> and then when he walks there, he looks like an artist. And she was so happy <laughs> when I was 16. Uh, but she was sort of smiling. This was something. And then maybe her friend told this to me then, or I don't know, probably not. She 
but you can see it stayed in my heart. It was sort of like something completely different than this more pragmatic kind of thing of my father's family, so her way of seeing me. Or then my, my friend from youth, he said, yeah, come on, you always had the best clothes on. You had the best shirts, you had the best, so, so that's what your mother. <laughs> she tricked out my father, he didn't have a lot of money, and he didn't even realize. So she wanted her son to be dressed now. <laughs> okay. So there's certain things that I can see. Maybe there was something. But I, this is me 50 years later, or even 60 years later, looking at these moments. It's just, I'm going to see that I'm abs absolutely not aware of anything. I just, this goes like this, and it was beautiful, right? like that. I went into the art school in the four cores, this is like at the Bauhaus four cores, four classes, same structure. I remember then we had this, by the way, the four cores was great. This was uh, just metier skills, a whole year. Drawing what you see, learning how to mix uh, every mix colors and so and looking exactly. So this was uh, great. I didn't like it so much at the time. Uh, I thought now when when you, bec you become an artist later, this is uh, not about art. This is about skills. But it was of course it was excellent. But I remember the time when the, uh, a painter who sort of gave uh, a lecture, we had made exercises on something called Farbe und Form, and gave it these exercises. So, and then we had to turn in project and so on, so he comes. One day he comes, he says, oh, I'm 20, 21. So he comes to the class, stands in front of these 30, 40 people and says, no, here I have looked at your works and then I have here I have one thing I haven't seen in a long time, this kind of color and this kind of, and then he started to praise her work and so how, how fantastic this was. And then it was mine. <laughs> so, so this is my mother or then or so, but I was never afraid, of, uh, never really aware of this. Forty years late, uh, many years later, I was a small little architect, a draftsman in this cantonal office. Then later I meet an architect uh, uh, I liked, a woman architect. And uh, in the context of the Swiss Federation of Architects, blah, 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 so I'm already <coughs> well known. So she says, yeah, I know you from a long time. We, I know you from a meeting at the Technoplik in Kur. Yeah, you, had, you were there and you had drawings out from there on the wall of art for the renovation of a farmhouse. You know, then I saw a great architect. But I didn't know. I mean, this is 20 years later. See, all she said, I could see from these drawings there's an architect right away. So this is nice to hear later, or maybe it's very good that uh, I didn't get uh, a lot of these compliments right away. So, But it's nice, to, you know what I'm talking about, it's sort of like a naive kind of way. It's also, it's sort of lightweighted. It's, uh, there's no, I don't, it's never felt any heavy weight on my shoulders, you should be this, so you should be that. When you said at the time, I can do it better, why did you reason that way? Did you think that uh, the other architects were just boring? Did they use the wrong materials? What was it that you thought, I can do better? This is my knowledge at the time. I. I was uh, in Gestaltung and Design, I was uh, good. I was good in art school. Uh, 
because I thought I, and I had the confidence, sort of, uh, yeah. But I was a little bit shy about architecture, because this I couldn't study really. I just started to look into it, so. Then, how is this? I tell you something else, when I was like 16, when I walked through the city of Basel and then I saw all these buildings, they were all so strange and different. They had this, and I looked at all these buildings and they, they, they're so strange. How could you ever come to an idea to make a building like this? And most of them were probably pretty obnoxious, pretty ugly, right? So I look, me as a boy, I look at this and they say, there, there is the ETH where they study architecture and there they learn this, how to do this and this a logic. There must be a logic I do not understand. Uh, but they learn this and they know. <laughs> so this was sort of like a ETH is big thing and uh, I'm just this a cabinet maker apprentice or so. They, this is what they know. This then 20 years ago, or whatever, I'm 35 or something, and then I look at this competition entries, having done a lot of things, having worked there and there, have been, and see, and I just saw mediocre and bad projects. <laughs> That's what I saw, I mean, right away. Nothing else, so I would probably, uh, you know, because, I mean, this must, I'm sure this must be, but this is not a good building. But uh, I had also, I had then when I made my, this is also interesting, when I made my first competition entry, then, they kicked me out in the first round. And this was in a historic uh, setting in the, in the, in a village in the Italian-speaking part here of this area historic setting, a schoolhouse, I think it was nothing big. There were some 12, 14 people participating. And it was all historic and you had to put this there and so. So uh, they put me out in the first round and then I went to look. And then I said, so bad what I did, so bad. This was full of sort of like trying to uh, you react on historic forms and so on, so on. Look at this. And then I saw a colleague who made the first, had made the first prize, which was an elegant, long building, and it didn't have any kind of uh, nothing to directly do with the proportions of this old stuff. So, and this was also a shock for me then. So, as it never happened to be three. I think the next one, I, uh, next one. Uh, I got the prize and then the other the next one uh, afterwards I won. But this was sort of like going back to the old education of art school where I said, come on now, I mean, this uh, is, you do something new, you don't, I just sort of, I thought theoretically I had overcome this kind of thing that something to copy, I said, no, you never copy, you're not old form. But I would then say, the new forms, they should come out of the old forms and there should be a transformation process of the old forms to the new form. Bullshit, right? This has to come inside of me. I have to, this comes from completely. And this was one competition where I saw this, how bad I was. <laughs> I was ashamed, yeah. but it was uh, high as hell. Architecture has its own tradition, also vernacular architecture, and I like to work with this material, which is also a more than a formal material, as I just was explaining before, which sort of didn't work really, <laughs> doesn't work at all. It's a, a sentiment, a feeling for things, right? So I do this building here, and then I make a garden, and this garden connects to the garden of my neighbor, 
and then I connect this garden to all the trees of the whole hill there. So if you stand there, you see this is, you could say, okay, this is the borrowed nature principle of Japanese architecture. But it's also a, a declaration of love to my, uh, to this place here, um, of being friendly. Uh, to what they, so in most of the places there is something I can greet nicely, I can acknowledge nicely, but also in the larger context uh, of building in the world, uh, I'm part of a big thing. This is uh, I like to be part of a big uh, of a big thing which comes from the past. So it's it's rich. And if you, it's difficult to create a building which has, which is beautiful or gives you the sensation of beauty or of calmness or of whatever. But it helps that, uh, or may I say it helps. It's successful when you look at it and you would say somehow everything new but something reminds me of something I've seen before. I cannot tell you exactly what it is, but there's something. So that's uh, the sign of a good building. <laughs> but some architects, they only focus on their own building and I seem to hear that you say even though the building is important, it cannot do without its surrounding. Surrounding is always mm -hmm. part of the building. It's the mental surrounding, it's uh, the biographical surrounding, it's, uh, it's the place where it stands. The place where a building stands is always a historic place. And the history is, the traces of history are stored in uh, topography, in a village, in a townscape, in a city in the landscape, uh, this, everybody knows this, so that's the material I work with and I would like to connect to. And then my building uh, starts to resonate, becomes valuable, more valuable than it would be standing just alone and egotistically and saying I'm the best, I'm a prima ballerina. If it sounds so, if, you know this, it's, if an architect can work with, uh, in city planning, this is very obvious, if you can work with old, already existing things which have a history, it's much easier to be successful with new things you add, right? So, I was just reading this before, the new Prada Museum largely lives from the fact that it's actually an old distillery or something. Huh? So. And I like this, I, I know this, this, to connect in a good way yeah, it forms this holistic atmosphere which is not a nicotistical atmosphere and sometimes that's why we make big models and on the big models we put everything there and the, sometimes the landscape and the surrounding is so beautiful that all of a sudden you see you actually need to add back there, nothing, volume there in the right place and everything is beautiful because it's already beautiful or something like that. So you then have to, first this is there and then I come and carefully do my thing. That's all. I like that. How do you discover, and you seem to be a master of discovering the spirit of a place, so that you actually have the feeling at the end, not only you, but many people that know your buildings, this is the right building for this right space. How do you, how do you end up there? How do you discover the spirit? I don't know. Maybe this is a talent or something. But it certainly has to do with my, what philosophers call, a phenomenological approach. I don't go with preconceived uh, ideas, ideologies, uh, to do something. I'm completely open. See? That this is certainly part of it. I'm open to do anything. 
And there was this good Dutch architect, she asked me 20 years after her lecture in the discussion, she said, yeah, Peter, are you, are you a modern architect? Are you a modern architect? What, what do you mean? I live now. <laughs> so I, of course, I knew what she meant. She meant uh, there's a sort of, uh, there should be a philosophy which, in, which wants to go forward and I'm innovative and uh, all these things. Nice. But I'm not interested in this. I'm not interested to make innovation for innovation's sake. This I had. At art school we were trained in this kind of... You could uh, reinvent the wheel, it didn't work, but you got a good grade because it was a good try, right? So, But this is, was when I was young, when you get older, when I got older, uh, this is uh, 20 years ago, I don't know, I, I, watch, I would do the right thing. I would like to connect in the right way to history and landscape and all these things, so I'm open. And I don't care if somebody says, you yeah, but this looks old, but nobody does it. I mean, as people go to the term of fast, they say it reminds me to maybe old ritual bass, but to, it re reminds me to something I have never seen or something. Connects back to the answer, you know what I want to say. That's, that I take as a compliment, but maybe the openness is important. So. The only quality, uh, apart from knowledge, education, I have my personal education, which I think is, um, through my interest, is pretty broad. Uh, apart from knowledge, personal knowledge, personal education, it's this openness of the approach, which is like this phenomenological, Look first, then say something. <laughs> first looking, de then think about it, and then say something, not the other way around. That's also the way we work here. The people have to learn. We look first, we feel first, we, and then we trust our feelings, and then we start to analyze our feelings, not the other way around. That's normally the other way around in architecture. <laughs>
We do the best. It's not say, okay, let's do this building, develop buildings, and I have this big kind of development firm, we do these buildings, and they have to hold up for two, uh, for two or three years, and then uh, we sell them, and then they can do whatever they want. So this, of course, largely exists. And you can see that it's a different kind of thing. So we, we are fighting for that this will, I think the schools of architecture also fight for this. Even though I may, I think in several areas they don't do uh, such a great job in that, but still the idea is that the architect is doing a good work for the people using his buildings. I don't, don't want to be more pathetic about this. I'm to serving you and mankind and all these things. It's, we don't have to go on that kind of level. We can just say decent work, a decent school, a decent house, a good apartment, well thought, and so on and so on. That's the social relevance of architecture. It's not so much, uh, th I think, to have philosophical ideas about uh, urbanism and so on and so on. I think, I think urbanism happens. From my observation, when I look at this, this happens. Things happen there where the money is. And in the big cities, you know, there's something Prada has a lot of money, something happens. But maybe in Milan it should not happen where Prada makes a museum. Maybe it should in Milano happen somewhere else on a social, but not there, right? Maybe if you if you say, great, now we have a gold-plated kind of old building for the Prada Museum. There's a, I think it's also a little bit cynical. There, I, there I'm an old 68 person, so I, I think it, I, can, I probably couldn't do this. I couldn't do this because I have a feeling uh, I'm contributing in a place. I, I think Prada is a great firm, and I'm sure these people, they're all great, and I would love to get to know them, and so on, and so on. But working for the rich is not easy for me. <laughs> and memory in Berlin you had a project where you formed a building that kind of would be the frame of one of the darkest side of human history what are your thoughts about a house as a frame as a symbol as a manifest of time of history of memory When I look back, I can see that maybe half of my buildings deal with this topic. One of my first buildings I did here in Kur was dealing with the Roman ruins. And then this Berlin building deal has dealt with this, with the left artifacts on the ground there of the Gestapo headquarters. Then in Cologne, I'm dealing again. What the, this is a whole, a, a several layers of old churches and an old chapel by Colin Gottfried Böhm and so on. And uh, now in Los Angeles, I'm dealing with tar pits and uh, the history of this place there for this museum. So uh, this is an ongoing kind of. Uh, characteristic of my work. I don't know where this comes from, but uh, I, like the f I like that it happens and I like to deal with the things and uh, I have developed approaches to deal with old things. And one of them has to do with my 10 years of Denkmann uh, Pflege in Graubünden, where I saw that you can take things and you don't, and you can go on building on them and add on and put something on top or on the side and create a new hole. 
instead of working in contrasts, which was the style of the 60s and 70s and 80s, and so old, new, heavy, light, and so on. So I, I never found this necessary to do for me. So this was, uh, this is one thing, and the other thing is, uh, uh, in art, the art, when art in the 60s and 70s became radical, like the American abstract guys and land art, and uh, going to back to basics, or when uh, Joseph Price started to work with the pure materials, of body of earth with materials, and so on. So there's an education which believes that there is history, even memory, in the things. So you can say, yeah, okay, the, the, in felt there is no memory. But you know what I mean? I mean, we look at felt in a certain setting, together with this and that, and it starts to tell us a story. Us, yeah, if you take it away, the story is gone. So there is something. Huh? So of course, the truth lies in the eyes of the beholder, but you have to pro you make something which can provoke this. So then I learned, I found out, this was the, my Berlin lesson, I should have known before, but there I learned this, that the normal historians understand history on paper. So that's what they learn in the university. History happens when I have a source, a document. So I take these documents, and from these documents on, I make my new things. So from paper to paper to paper to paper to paper to paper. So the real thing is uh, lost, or uh, it's, uh, I don't know, you get to details, and it becomes a, a very specific kind of world, this academic history. For sure, it has little to do with the history happened, which happened on the ground, which is material, where there's a physical presence. And that's the history Joseph Beuys worked with, right? This, uh, at not the historians, and that's where I come from, so I look at this place in Berlin and say, on the ground level, dear historians, no comments from you. Ground level, that's the ground and it speaks for itself. So the historians would say, this ground, there's nothing left. Then I say, yes, that's it. See, that's what the ground says. You have tried, Germans have tried to take everything away, but a few small things. This, um, and then I wanted to show one left excavated thing further down of a uh, where people were tortured in the basement of the Gestapo headquarters. And there are these guys who got the commissions in Germany uh, in the 50s or 60s to even deep down in the earth take away every trace, they cheat a little bit, so there is something, right? So they discovered this later. So I say, this becomes a major pavilion in the entrance of my thing, and you can look down and see this. So the historian says, this is only this little thing. Why don't one so... Oh. So uh, they hated me because I was insisting on this is part of history. Also the fact that it only a little bit is left. Or it, not, not, not also, but that, that's maybe the biggest kind of thing you can learn there. That only a little thing is left, the rest, everything has been done away right with. This uh, stays a bit outside. This doesn't enter. This doesn't enter my life here. I can go and work with my young colleagues over there as a Pritzker Prize architect. I'm working like uh, 30 years ago. <coughs> I'm trying to find out, and I know that this is good. This is not yet good. So this. So it doesn't. It, it does. I don't feel this. You know? It's um, it stays outside, sort of like a. <laughs> I think 
they gave me a, a couple of weeks ago. I was in Asuncion for some reason, and then there, at the end of my talk, they came <coughs> gave me an honorary doctor well, with all these things and so on, a gold medal. And, and then you, this is there, and then we smile, and we say thank you, and then I take this away, and the gold medal hangs there in the kitchen somewhere, and uh, the stuff. So it's more like that. It's, I say, okay, it's good. I'm grateful. It helps me in my work. Uh, it's easier to explain to clients the way I work. They are more inclined to believe me when I say I would like to work like this or work like this. Uh, and I feel flattered and so on, but it doesn't enter my everyday. When I go with my grandchildren, they always already talk to me like that. So I go yesterday. This boy, he's 10, then this is my first house still living there. He knows they like it. His father likes it, my son. <laughs> but he would be on this. These two small guys, ch children, they would say, Peter, but this is not so nice here. <laughs> so they would make fun of me. So this, and I love this. As did my children treat me like we always talk like that. So. They would say, oh, this doesn't look exactly like a Pritzker Prize kind of thing, what do you do? <laughs> so, it stays outside, it's nice, it doesn't affect my life.